All right. Everybody go ahead and approve that and we will get going. So welcome everybody to the first part one, basically the first webinar of many uh, to come. Um, on basically on the top of how to win the future and exploration of the third generation of the internet. Now, these calls are open to the public, um, not just coin carriers, uh, although I will be bringing in uh, different aspects of, of some success laws to help you guys understand how they integrate into this arena as well. So we will be doing these, we're, we're working on the schedule right now with myself and with uh, Alan as a co-host here with me, or with and we'll also have some other speakers coming in, other experts in different facets of this industry. And we're working on scheduling these out, but where it stands now and watch for the actual official announcement is we'll be, we'll be doing two webinars a month. And then on the in-between weeks, we'll be doing two clubhouse calls or potentially a LinkedIn call, uh, kind of like a fireside discussion on what we spoke about the week before. So with that, I recommend you guys have a pad of paper, write down your questions. If we don't answer them tonight, the next meeting at some point next week, we'll all get on a clubhouse or whatnot, which will record those as well. Uh, and just go through the Q and A that way if we don't get them covered tonight. So let's see if there's anything I was gonna add onto that. Uh, not tonight, I'm gonna pass this over to Mr. Alan Rodriguez. I wanna talk about him for a second. I've been working with this guy for the better part of a year. Is that correct, Alan? But, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, some of you guys know uh, what I do as a coin carrier, what I do in funding and capital raises and whatnot. And uh, the process is somewhat rigorous, but I guess the better way to put it is it's very structured and structured by some very, very um, intelligent and and uh, successful people within within the alliance. And what happened was, is maybe a year ago, I sent out the structure and out of the 28 deals that were in the hopper that I was working through with the with funding um, only four of them came through the other side and Alan was one of those uh, when people are told what they need to do and how hard something is a lot of times they're like yeah I don't know if I want to do all that so Alan was one of those he's consistently taken my advice uh, he's consistently uh, basically taken action on it there's been times where he's been a little hard-headed but we all are uh, but he's he's getting better at that and, and it's been really cool to see the the um what's the word i'm looking at looking for the compounding effect of the time spent with them it's like we're picking up speed and i've become more and more and more excited to work with this guy uh and launch this series and everything we're doing based on his project in this arena so that being said i'm going to pass it over to alan and he's going to talk to you guys for 30 35 40 minutes or so and then we'll open up for a q a Again, this is being recorded, so you don't have to memorize everything. And we'll also have a clubhouse next week where we go over Q&As if your questions don't get answered tonight. That being said, Alan, take it away. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Better. This has been an amazing journey. Um, I just Before I go, I just think it's funny to mention this. You know, we're all you know, pretty much all in the alliance here. And when I first put this together, I had three sections. I had what's going on in the world in red. I had what it means for everyone here in yellow. And then I have what I'm doing in blue. And I think in the first session, Aaron, it took me about three minutes and I kind of ditched everything I was doing and realized just to be others oriented and to focus on what's happening in the world and what it means for everyone. So this is pretty much what everyone's gonna to get today is a, a repeat and hopefully an improved version of the first one uh, with much more of a focus on, uh, on helping everyone here understand what's happening in the world and, and how to and how to successfully navigate it. Um, again, my name is Alan Rodriguez. I'm uh, the founder of the Data Freedom Foundation. We're a, a digital civil rights organization committed to ensuring technology serves and empowers humanity. Um, I'm an inventor and a product manager. We'll have other people on this series that are more technology oriented or more business oriented or, or in the case of Joel, more finance oriented. Um, but my perspective is one of, of an adventure and a product person. So I run around the world reading a whole lot and creating mental tools and models to sort of understand the big themes in technology and society, which then I try and use to try and predict the future, <laughs> which is a totally futile thing to do, but I still keep doing it. I've done it my whole life, um, admittedly with, with like mixed results, but this is what inventors and product people do. Um, and I want to try and impart some of these mental models to everyone here. Um, 
it, predicting the future is really hard. So what we need to, I think, think about when we look at this idea of Web3 and this next iteration of the internet, fundamentally, we're, we're dealing with great uncertainty and great risks. Um, but what's important, I think, at the end of this session is, is that everyone, uh, I hope, understands that there's even greater opportunities. Um, Web3 is many things. It's disruptive. It's even controversial. I've seen more negative press over the course of the last two months than I think I've, I've seen over the past six to eight, eight months. Um, but ultimately, what we're talking about here when we say Web3, it's about what kind of digital human experience we can imagine and create for our children and future generations of, of, of humanity. That's really the big ask of us, right? Is what kind of digital human beings do we want to create? Um, when we think about this, this model, the consensus out here in, in, in the world is that we've gone through kind of three iterations of the internet. At first we had desktops and we connected them. And that was, that kind of transformed society. But users were anonymous. Um, in many ways, the platforms were read only. The first version of the web, you could read the source code of the pages. And so it was largely open, but there really wasn't an identity layer to it. Um, web two that we largely have today, users are the data. There's lots of problems with the environment and the systems we have today. The platforms are, are, are intermediaries like social platforms um, or even, even traditional institutions like banks. Uh, they're largely unaccountable. And of course, who can read the code for these systems? Facebook doesn't ask us to vote on the code of Facebook's platform. None of these platforms do. So this is what we talk about when we talk about like Web2 and the current, the current environment. Um, ultimately, just to, because the, this is an introduction, the problem with Web2 is that it's fundamentally incompatible. Uh, the surveillance and the lack of privacy, the lack of control of our data, the inability for us to monetize our identities and data, um, it's incompatible with digital self-rule, with the idea of a digital open and participatory society. And so that's really what we're fighting over is imagining this new digital world and evaluating all the parts and components that make it up and making choices as people and communities about what will our digital future be. And we're hoping, those of us uh, on, on a certain uh, side of this, we're hoping that users will own their data. And we, uh, we, we're beginning to have the tools and the platforms for this to occur, for us to own and assert our identities and for communities of people to collaborate and control the platform and actually vote. We'll talk about briefly about DAO tokens. Um, that's similar to the way people buy stock and can vote uh, like in a, in a, in a for-profit organization. DAO tokens function both for nonprofits and for-profits. The DAO token holder can, can vote on the code. So imagine being able to uh, have a Facebook where the people that are participants get to vote on the code that makes up how Facebook works, or even your bank for that matter. These, these themes are bigger than just three, really. When we think about technology throughout civilization, um, this, is, this, is, this has been happening over and over and over again. We've seen technology largely over our, our parents' lifetimes. Uh, many technologies. And one of the interesting themes we see over time as technologies are, are brought into society and are adopted is this 25% sort of market adoption threshold. What we see over time is we reach this threshold with technologies in terms of mass adoption in shorter and shorter time frames. This is a really common theme. It's, 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 a, it's an interesting thing when you think about products and innovation. This is a really important idea. Um, you can visualize this. I think it's even more impactful when it's visualized. So here we see earlier technologies taking decades to adopt, even some of them going backwards for almost a decade before resuming adoption forward again. But what you notice over, we get over here to the right, is not only do we have many, many more technologies all stacked up, but we see adoption in, in, in years. So when we're evaluating these, this landscape, it's important to kind of comprehend these big themes, uh, technology and, and, and societal themes about how we adopt tech technology. There's, I'm gonna layer three other ideas into this before moving forward, but 
I think um, many of you have heard probably of at least one of these ideas. Each line is a different idea. The blue one is the law diffusion of innovation, where we see innovators first coming into the space and then early adopters and then an early majority and then a, finally a late majority and a tipping point and then eventually everyone is adopting a technology becomes ubiquitous. We also have this idea of um, a hype cycle, which is where something is hyped by the innovators to some peak of inflated expectations. We could say that many Web3 technologies are in this state or approaching it. And then as we start to use it to solve problems, it plummets into this trough of disillusionment. Some people call this the chasm, jumping from around 15, 20% to, to 30. Um, technologies or protocols or platforms or blockchains or tokens, all these things will move through this cycle. This, this yellow one, it has to do with the idea of componentization of technology, that things initiate as a, as a, they're sort of invented and then they move into a custom build state. And then eventually, if you can actually do something with it, it'll turn into a productization state and it'll grow rapidly to a 50% uh, tipping point. And then eventually it'll become ubiquitous and everyone adopts it. So when you're looking at this space, you wanna ask yourself when you're evaluating a technology or a token or a business model, where is it in this adoption curve? If you're curious why tokens go up so high and then they collapse and there are so many of them that ride up and down and up and down, it's because of this, trough, this peak of inflated expectations and this trough of disillusion. Obviously, you don't wanna be the, the person that buys here and then sells here, right? So knowing where, uh, where, what your, you know, whatever the investment is, where it is in this cycle, um, helps you understand um, how to how to uh, invest and diversify intelligently. For those of you that know who A16Z is, that's Anders and Horowitz. This is um, perhaps one of the most notable VC firms. This is their take on it. They say Web3 is a group of technologies. Uh, that uh, encompasses blockchains, cryptographic protocols, which we're gonna dig into in a bit, uh, this idea of digital assets, this idea of decentralized finance, which is really the first place in which we're seeing these tokens and technologies sort of, if you will, rip through this trough of disillusionment because we can actually do financial transactions online without banks or governments. And that's actually happening today. And so distributed finance is probably one of the, you could say it's one of the first areas of adoption where we're, where we're rocketing through this trough and out the other side. Um, let's see real quick. So let's just talk about DeFi. So um, yeah, we talked about the, the financial transactions without assistance from banks, banks and governments. Um, we're seeing, obviously we're seeing large numbers of companies and venture capital firms and people investing in, in this space. Um, I think Yesterday or the day before, we heard that Warren Buffett uh, divested all the stock of Visa and MasterCard and is moving a billion dollars into this space. And then just this morning, I think the New York Stock Exchange, I heard, uh, wants to get into NFT exchanges. These are indicative of technologies tearing through this trough of disillusionment and coming out the other side. So this is also an interesting graph. Um, we're, we're seeing over here, this is sort of the adoption curve of web versus the internet. Uh, we have the number of users on one side, uh, we have a number of blockchain wallets on the other, and we have years since uh, years of adoption. So this is another example of us seeing that this, 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 these technologies are tracking similarly to previous ones. Um, with that, I'm going to take a, let's see, I'm going to take a, a bigger dive and everyone take a deep breath because we're going to get a little technical for a second. And we're going to talk about how these things work so that we can make sense out of the players and who they are and why they matter. So if you're in the traditional technology space, you might be familiar with this idea of a protocol layer, uh, this idea that we have an internet protocol and a transport and application protocol. These things are, it's very important that we have one standard for these things because we have hardware that has to be compatible with it and consumers and business people have learned if there's more than one hardware standard, the buyers of the technology are gonna pay dearly for it. So there's a huge impetus on the hardware side to have only one standard. 
And then we have all these applications that get built on top of these technologies. And this is sort of the traditional web. It's important to know that there's a similar protocol hierarchy over on the blockchain side. And we can evaluate players on this side by thinking about who were the players on the traditional web and how did that evolve? So in the blockchain space, we have this, you know, the hardware similar to the traditional side, but we have the, what's called a layer one protocol. These are gonna be um, all the big blockchains that, that the people are aware of, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, I can go on and on and on. Um, these blockchains compete on, uh, on both their governance model they also compete on their algorithmic efficiency, on uh, how will they scale, on their transactional costs. Um, and there's many of them. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how they work and, and how one would evaluate one over another and their utility. There's this layer two concept with smart contracts. So one can think of these layer one protocols as very similar to Visa or MasterCard. And if you're a business and you wanna take payments, you really want to work, you want to build your applications on top of layer two protocols that work across layer one protocols. So you can think of the layer one protocols as being a big ledger in the sky that kind of stacks, stacks up, but not all your customers are going to be on the same blockchain. So you generally want to build a consumer experiences and, and, uh, and hook into the payment systems at the, at the layer two layer. This spans the, the layer one protocols it allows you to build an application that can reach people across many blockchains. So when you're thinking about the space and when you, you see these tokens and, and coins and, and whatnot, it's important to, to think about where they are in the stack because the money is gonna flow down. Um, and we can evaluate these technologies based, um, based largely on adoption. So the same business model concepts that we apply to the traditional space like, um, like risk analysis, competitive analysis, and business model analysis, we can do that here as well. We can look at where a player is, we can look at their competitors in their spaces. We can look at a blockchain at say layer one and see how many layer twos it connects to and then how many applications are built on top of that and how many users are using those applications. So there's, there's a structure to this and, and, and it mirrors tr the traditional web as well. And, and it's, we can describe blockchains as a technology in a, in a, in a very simple way. And I, it, it, it's almost mind boggling how simple they are. Uh, and it's also mind boggling how powerful that simplicity is. When we think about all of them, generally speaking, you can imagine a big spreadsheet in the sky where we have two columns. We have IDs or sets of, of, of numbers, numbers and characters that, that are paired. This, this is what is, is the, the tech people refer to this as a primitive. Okay. And, um, and they're constantly inventing new ones. But this is all of blockchain really is, is, is a spreadsheet with two columns, a big shared one in the sky that people can't delete. And these IDs represent people and assets. They can be physical or digital. When you own, when, when you possess a wallet ID, you possess the right to add a record for an asset ID and update the person or wallet ID. And then when you do that, that person then assumes the right to make the next record. That's it. And what's fascinating is we're just dealing with numbers and characters that are paired. And so what these numbers mean and the relationship between them is in, in the community that uh, decides these things is uh, is what drives all the variation and all of the excitement and all of the experimentation. So real quick, we're, we will go, there's non-fungible and fungible, let me talk about fungible tokens, That's, that should be right now. So um, you'll notice over here on the asset side, so if these represented quarters, we would know that you can combine the bottom three and get three quarters of a dollar. But if these, if these characters represent a vehicle identification number, you can't combine them. You, you, you can't divide them. And then fungible means that you can, you can take them apart and you can reassemble them. 
So if these were VINs for cars, we know we can't, we can't just trade one for another. They're worth different values. And so when we're talking about um, fungible tokens versus non-fungible tokens, the, the fungible ones means that they're always the same value. And so you can transact with them in terms of payments. And Joel will be speaking in the next session uh, more about uh, the payment mechanisms and uh, the, co the tokens and coins and, um, uh, and how one uses them for a business for a payment system. Um, but for now, for this session, we have to kind of breeze over these topics really, really fast. So, uh, so blockchains are really this simple, guys. It's, 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 it's data in, in two columns, and it's what they mean to the, to the community that's actually using them. So, so it's no different if it's a non-fungible token. It's just that the community is giving these IDs different meanings. Um, the, the, the wallet side also can, can, has that same flexibility. We can also issue what's happening in, in this world is really fascinating and we'll have a whole session just on distributed autonomous organizations, but these tokens can allow uh, people, can give them the right to vote. So let's say um, it's sort of like, um, if any of you have done any kind of software development, um, the, there's gonna be a code repository and people will check out the code, they'll edit it, and then they'll wanna merge it back in. So imagine the developers getting to vote on merging the code back into the, in, in, into the, the main branch. That's what these tokens allow. So now with this empower, because the people decided that's what, that's what these numbers and that's what the relationship actually means. So this empowers an, a group of people to come together to form this distributed organization to decide on a mission. It might be a bank, it might be insurance, it might be, a, a, it could be farmers wanting to do insurance together. It could be, um, it could be any kind of group of people who want to uh, collaborate with one another. They can now uh, construct these organizations. They can construct these intermediaries um, that are transparent and trustable, mathematically trustable. So I'm going to dig down one more level, um, if you guys can follow me. The way that all this works is, and this is, this is what's, this is the big change that's happening for, for Web3, is software and even the ecosystem of software is built in this idea of composability. So we can have businesses that use each other's businesses, or we can have software that uses different pieces of other people's software. What's happening in this cryptographic and algorithmic space is that the cryptographers have been creating these, what are called, math, I call them mathematical devices, for lack of a better term. They're constantly inventing new ones. And a blockchain is, and then the protocols that are competing with one another are assemblages of these mathematical devices. So let me give you some examples. So um, in the cryptographic space, we have mathematical devices that ensure the two parties can exchange keys and can talk securely. For instance, we have mathematical devices that allow uh, two parties that, that are communicating securely to know if anyone's intercepted the message. We have math mathematical devices that allow people to share their keys, to protect their keys. We have mathematical devices that allow people to allow people to ask questions of their data. It's called a zero knowledge proof and get an answer, but not reveal the underlying data. What's happening that's fascinating here is that the cryptographic community has been inventing these cryptographic or mathematical devices for 20 and 30 years. What Bitcoin did and what blockchains are doing is it's the first practical uses for these mathematical devices. And they're just beginning to invent them. <laughs> All right. So when we're looking at these coins and tokens and the underlying protocols or blockchains, what's happening is uh, as the, the cryptograph, the cryptographers are inventing these new mathematical devices, uh, the software engineers are assembling them in new and interesting and innovative ways. And to highlight this, well, I, would, I want to point out for a moment, one can be pro uh, Web3, but anti-blockchain. It may seem kind of uh, paradoxical, but that's, that's actually true. The, um, there's actually classes of blockchains that assemble these mathematical devices in different ways that result in different properties. So we have blockchains that are sort of the, the original uh, assemblage of these mathematical devices, like 
Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many others. We call these uh, mostly the, the, these are these are the generally the, the layer one protocols. But they use mining to create a consensus amongst the people in the community. But today alone, we know that <clears throat> there's three other types of cryptographic machines we can assemble. <clears throat> One of them is a, is a hash graph where the nodes create a consensus through, through voting. But note it's a graph structure as opposed to a chain structure. What that means is, is that we have nodes and we have connections between them. So it's inherently peer to peer. It's hard to surveil this. It's completely different construction, completely different mathematical devices with completely different properties. It still does the, the ledger, but now it's between nodes and it has no mining. So it has very high transaction throughput and, and low costs, for instance. The same goes with what's called a direct, uh, a cyclic graph or a DAG. Again, this is, a, this is literally a graph structure. Imagine blockchains, but with individuals owning essentially their own blockchain and the chain is between nodes in the, in the graph. This, when we look at tokens on a DAG, they, they have the properties of digital cash. Completely different set of mathematical devices assembled to do something different for the community with different properties. And we can go on and on. Um, the, the cryptographic community is continuing to invent new assemblages of these mathematical devices, as well as uh, new ways of enhancing or differentiating the players in these spaces. So um, hopefully this begins to, to, to convey to everyone the, the potential here, right? When we hear about all these crypto coins going up and down and all these exciting things with NFTs, um, it's all experimentation. And it's all just the very beginnings of this new Web3 world where we can construct these digital intermediaries with new and interesting properties. And we're just beginning to invent them. So just kind of ponder that, the, 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 the scope of this. Um, just as a sampling of what this might look like in a specific industry, let's look at decentralized finance. Sorry for all the tokens everywhere. And Joel, yours is not on here. So this, this, this clearly is wrong. Um, but th these are just classifications of different people in, in these different layers. So just in decentralized finance, we have prediction markets, lending, marketplaces, liquidity, asset tokenizations, payments, compliance and identity, stable coins, which Joel will talk more about in the next session, infrastructure, wallets, asset management. And this just scratches the surface. This is the surface. And so when we're looking at all these different companies, and Lord knows every one of them has at least a token, we want to understand what is it doing in the ecosystem? Who, let's go back to, 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 to this graph, right? What are the applications being built on it? How fast are people adopting those applications? Um, if, it's, if it's a layer two, how many other blockchains does it, does it operate across? There's, there's metrics that we can assemble about, uh, about, about the, these coins and their utility and, and how they're operating in, the, in, this, in this new and emergent digital ecosystem. And keep in mind that, you know, we have this, this, this uh, you know, peak of inflated expectations and trough of disillusionment kind of going on. So as we innovate and as new ideas are introduced, they're going to go through this curve. And not all of them are going to come through and actually be useful. So these, I think, are the, the most sort of useful techniques to sort of understand the space and sort of the, the, the bigger, the big themes. Um, I think the most important part that I want to convey to everyone is, is the immense opportunity. Um, it's, it's useful to think of this as a, as a physical economy and a digital economy that are increasingly uh, interconnected. And we're increasingly living in a world where we, in our lifetime, I, I've never really had to deal with a world where there was more than one US currency, um, but we all do now. And that's what this, this digital economy is, is sort of unleashing on us. But don't be confused by the words or the technology. Um, in, in almost every case, on the physical side, there's a digital equivalent. And on the digital side, there's a physical equivalent. Everyone, I think, understands that there's assets on both sides. There's payments on both sides. There's kind of regulation on both sides. And I'm going I'm to have a question mark here for a purpose. The, um, 
while the human behaviors in the digital economy are poorly regulated today, one could argue that the intermediaries, because they're, they're, they're based on code and the code is open, unlike say banks or Facebook, they're more regulated and they're transparently regulated. So this is an interesting concept, but don't, don't, be, don't be fooled as you look at this space and learn about this space. There are investment advisors on both sides. There are research providers on both sides. There are risk analysts on both sides, in, increasingly. There are business analysts. There are ways of analyzing the business. You can, you can hire people to do the, there, there are companies and groups of people that are now emerging that are investment advisors, research providers, risk analysts. Uh, and and any, any of us as, as business people should be able to do some basic business analysis, and financial analysis, competitive analysis. So, the, the big takeaway um, really is, as we think about this space, don't think long, short term, um, th think, think long term, think um, five to 10 years out, um, begin imagining what, uh, what your industry, each of you are in uh, different industries or, or you have customers that are in different industries, begin thinking about uh, what this could mean for your industry. If your industry has uh, intermediaries that are not trusted, that take more and more and more out of the out of the economy between the buyers and suppliers in in, in your ecosystem, they're ripe for disruption. Um, I think um, you know Berkshire Hathaway divesting all of its stock in Visa and Mastercard speaks to that. And of course, as I said, you know when we look to invest in this space, you can do it intelligently. You can you can do it by by reaching if, if you would use if, if you use research and risk analysis and investment advisors in the physical economy, seek out those people over in the digital economy. They they increasingly exist and they're increasingly sophisticated. And if you need any help with that, I, I have people that I can connect you to. Um, so let's see. Oh, this is a fun exercise. So now we've gotten to a point where I'm going to do kind of a kind of a little game with everyone, just to sort of um, play with ideas. Um, I like to sort of go through this process of thinking of Web one and two and three and, and trying different ways of describing it. Uh, the more ways we can describe it, I think the more we're able to sort of take an object and look at it from different perspectives and understand it. So. As I said uh, or alluded to before, with Web 1, we can think of it as having no identity. But with Web 2, they own our identity. And with Web 3, you own your identity. Whoops, that's a typo. Uh, we own our, our identity. Um, you can think of it as the, the, the frontier and the wild west and the rule of law. You can think of it as distributed data in media, right? Imagine what it was like, or remember what it was like for some of you that are, that are my age or older, uh, connecting to the internet for the first time, right? We could, uh, for the first time, we could um, connect all of our media and data, data together. But as we moved into Web3, it became monopolized data and media. As we think about Web3, we want it to be monetized. We, we, we want to monetize our data and media. Another way of thinking about it is uh, Web1 is the network. Then we moved into all these walled gardens. Web1 was supposed to disintermediate dis all kinds of, of, of third parties, right? Really what happened was we built massive um, platforms that disintermediated everything. As we look into Web3, we need to be thinking about dismantling these walled gardens and building the human experience that we, that we, that we desire to have. Another way of thinking about it is the age of sale, the age of piracy, and the age of commerce. Cyberspace is not too different from uh, when, when humans started conducting commerce on, over the oceans. This is a common paradigm we see in, in history, kind of repeat over and over again. This is a bit, a bit bold, but we can even say created, enslaved, and liberated. That is the hope. Um, we went from data being read to data being read and written to now we have the ability for data to be executed like smart contracts. Our technology can be much, much more intelligent and it can serve us in new and interesting ways. So gonna, let me just take a moment to explain this. Um, there's a, for people that may not know, uh, there's a very important gentleman in sort of the, 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 the thinking of civil or digital civil liberties, um, John Perry Barlow, he was the a writer for the Grateful Dead, and he was one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I want to say in around 1993, 
he wrote the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, which sort of asserted the concept that this, this, this great internet thing we were building was, uh, was global. It was beyond the reach of any one government and that they weren't welcome there. Um, he anchored these ideas. He, he drafted a document called The Economy of Ideas in 1994, where he documents and, and, and uh, the properties of the economic properties of, of information. And he describes the, 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 the ambition of creating an economy of ideas. And he talks about the risks and the, his concerns and the problems of getting there. And by about 2016, we began to see this phrase, that is the new oil. One could say we failed. We failed to build this economy of ideas that the EFF and John Perry Barlow had, had imagined. And so we have a chance. We have a chance to build Web3 and build a kind of digital rule of law to bring about this economy of ideas. And then ultimately, when you guys think about this and what it means for you, this really is about business models. If, if you've taken anything out of this out of this sort of introduction, it's this rapid innovation of business models. We have legacy business models that were disrupted by Web1. This idea of them being disintermediated, but not really. We ended up having data monopolies disintermediating everyone. We want to end this. We want to move into this, this, this world of the economy of ideas that, that we've been striving for since the beginning of Web1 and the equivalent business models or the, the emergent business models that this, that this brings about. We will have a whole session actually on, on this idea of economy of ideas where we dig into the properties of information um, and what that can mean for these business models. Um, and with that, we have, what Aaron, we have like a little more than 15 minutes. And before we open it up to questions, I just want to just give people a, a quick preview. This was an introduction to Web3, a very quick introduction. Some introductions to this go on for an hour and a half with no questions. So you guys got the short version. Um, we'll move into the properties of digital money with, uh, with Joel next. Uh, then we'll talk about NFTs. Then we'll talk about distributed autonomous organizations. Then we'll loop back and talk about that economy of ideas. Then we'll talk about the metaverse. And then just to make sure everyone's suitably terrified uh, about what could happen if everything goes wrong, we're going to talk about the internet of behaviors and the way that we're surrounded by addictive and manipulative technologies. Uh, and then ultimately, we want to talk about AI. Uh, and, um, and with that, I guess, Aaron, we're ready for questions, right? Well, yeah, let me just uh, recap a couple of things, guys, from, from the perspective. A couple of things came to mind as he was talking. I want you guys to understand. A lot of this stuff might be confusing to you okay totally fine i want you guys to open up to not write this stuff off uh and also open up to a big growth opportunity to where realizing that you don't have to fully understand this to benefit from this to step into this to be able to capitalize and, and to win the future for yourself it's about getting a team around you to be able to help with some of these things so all businesses are going to head in this direction and I encourage you to open your mind to that and open your mind to the, the right strategic partnerships and alignments and helpers and the guides and everything to help you do that, not just write it off because it might be hard to digest or you might be exhausted tonight even after listening to this. Know that we're doing it in this way because it's very important for you at least to have an understanding, basic understanding of all of this to actually truly capitalize on this in a long term way. Uh, most people think of this industry in this arena uh, as crypto and it's a lottery mentality. That's not the way we're presenting this. That's not the way I do business. Uh, that's not the way that a lot of the people on this call do business. So yes, you can learn how to hop in and, and uh, capitalize on some, some quick opportunities in the crypto markets and in NFTs. But ultimately, if you want longevity with this and you want peace of mind with this, you're going to want to at least be on these calls, watch the the uh, replays, get on the Q and A's and just get a grasp for it. What I mean by that is I'm the type of person who needs to understand how something works so I can show up and flow through it. I don't necessarily get in the weeds and all the details of something, but just to give you a reference on what I mean, back in 2017, I got involved with Bitcoin. I learned how to trade, okay? I learned how to do it. I didn't learn how to read charts. I did a little bit, but I didn't learn all the ins and outs and the technical aspects. I just learned how to make my trades. And I turned within from June of 2017 to December of 2018, or excuse me. Yeah, June 2017 to December of 18, I turned four Bitcoin into 100. 
by just learning what I needed to learn. So I understood how to function in the arena of trading Bitcoin. That's what I'm asking you guys to open yourself up to. What do you need to learn to be able to be productive in this industry and understand because it's coming, whether we like it or not, uh, this stuff is going to change. And usually people just don't like stuff because they don't understand it. So again, I can dive into that on a different call, but I want you guys to remain open and know that we're here to walk you through this stuff to a degree. Uh, but it's, it might take some time on your own. The other thing I wanted to bring up tonight is one, well, two different things. I'm going to be working in a different success law with these, a brief reference to it for you guys to study and understand how they apply. One of them, all of this has to do with the law of the straight line. And what I mean by that, it, it, can, it can be part of the initial, which is your active hours income, the money you can make on your own. Then we have the second, the money that others can make you. Like, obviously, if you have a staff and you have employees in a business. And then the third is your money making you money. This can apply to all of that, right? Uh, but when you think about your money making you money, it's longer term plays. And this is where the longer term plays are headed. So I want you to think about that. To the law of exchange. Alan and I were talking about this the other day and web one and web two, or especially web two, definitely not fair exchange. You know, they're taking our data, who we are and basically capitalizing on it and manipulating people. Even, even the smartest of us still will get caught up in that, which is not fair exchange at all. So going into web three, what Alan is talking about here and what a lot of the guest speakers we're gonna bring in on are talking about having a fair exchange at a minimum on the, on the new version of the internet. So I want you guys to think of it that way too, because as you open up to where the laws fit in your life, they fit everywhere in your life. So that being said, I'm gonna pass it back to Alan for Q and A's and uh, Alan, you wanna, wanna take the screen down so we can yeah. see everybody and. Hopefully you guys know how to raise your hands uh, and I'll, I'll try to watch the timing on when hands are raised. Uh, and I can answer some questions, but I think Alan will be doing most of the, the, the Q and A. So we got J.R. Edens first, Alan. Go ahead and unmute yourself when I call on you. Hey, Alan, awesome information. I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, two questions, real quick. First one is, are you going to go into not only what NFTs are, but also how we as a group can, can if you're very new to it, like I am, <clears throat> how you can buy it, what places to go, things like this as well. And then also, when is the next uh, meeting of this? Alan, do you want to, I can answer both those or you can answer them both too. All right. Well, we kind of can answer both. I'll answer that. You answer. <laughs> you're as good. far yeah. as uh, references and referrals on where you can learn more, get more education, potentially get involved in different aspects of, of all this and to your question NFTs, we will have uh, people to refer you to definitely. We might not necessarily go into a training on how to, right Alan, am I right on that? Mm, yeah. It's more of a, it will yeah. be a reference for taking action. And as far as when's the next one, we're gonna be deciding that tomorrow-ish, uh, but the objective is to have two of these a month, every other week. And then in the in-between weeks, we'll have a clubhouse or a LinkedIn call where we do Q and A. So if you don't get your questions answered tonight, on the in-between weeks of the webinars, we'll be doing a QA and a in that sense. Does that, does that answer that, JR? Great stuff, thank you so much. Awesome. All right, we got you, Maribel. Oh, wait, wait, let me finish, let me answer JR. Yeah, let JR, Alan chime before in. Before we go. Um, that's a good question, JR. Um, the, um, would it surprise all of y'all if I told you I don't own any of it? Yeah, that would be very surprising. Um, just because no. it seems like you go into it quite a bit. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, m my take on it is I I want to build in it. I want to I want to take my resources and the resources of others and uh, and take uh, a set of values around what it means to be human in a digital world and make sure that we build those platforms and technologies out there. Um, I think that uh, there's immense opportunities to build the right things and to make lots of money doing it. Um, and so, I would encourage people. Yeah, unless this is the takeaway, really, it, unless you're privy to all these players, uh, the competitive landscape, the protocol landscape, uh, the developers that are moving from one to another because they like the governance of the technology of one over another. Um, if you're not plugged into that, I mean, I'm not even plugged into it enough for me to feel comfortable like I should be buying and selling this stuff. Um, but then again, I was also. Uh, I was raised and, and taught to own a casino, not, not gamble in one. So um, that's sort of in my DNA. Um, but, uh, but that's how I see it. I'd rather, I'd rather build a casino. Well, I don't want to build a casino, actually. But what I'm saying is, is I'm not going to go play in one, right? So um, 
that's why I suggested, you know, for instance, if you wanted to invest in this space, there are there are there are investment groups, there are investment advisors that are that are that are beginning to, to emerge. Uh, I can point you to some of them, and I think there are people on Bellwether. Maybe maybe we could begin to to work on that. Um, there are people that do risk analysis um, in this space. Um, if you wouldn't buy stock without doing some basic analysis of of the of the asset. You shouldn't be doing that in the digital space either. So that's a good point, Alan. Uh, and it's also a point of who you are and your personality. Alan's one who, and I personally do as well, who's going to in, uh, invest his time. And some people will want to invest their money in the people who are building this out and the people who are doing it in the right way, ethical way, uh, with high core values like Alan is. And then there'll be some that want to get into it. Whether that's why I was talking about the law of the straight line. All three aspects of that, all of it, apply to this. So it's asking yourself who you are and owning you who you are, and then doing something with it. You know, I have some crypto, and I also am really getting into the space of everything that goes behind and the tech behind it now. That's exciting to me for the long term play, especially right now, honestly, because of what we're just in the beginning stages of stuff, uh, and I know that that's going to skyrocket in itself. So. You got to ask yourself who you are. There's no right or wrong in a broad sense on this. It's based on you. So, but yes, we'll have refer referrals and stuff for, for all aspects of any avenue you want to travel down, JR. All right, Maribel. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Aaron and Lannan, for the um, whole presentation. I'm very new in this topic. This is, this is I'm level minus one, I would say. So this is totally new to me and I'm trying to understand and, and, and follow you guys. So um, I was wondering if there is, if there are any resources out there where I can have a look like examples by industry. Um, in my case, I'm building an online language school. So I would like to somehow see if, if let's say in the education industry, there are some examples of the traditional web and the web three, so I can I can better understand that. And maybe since I'm building now, uh, what are the things that I should be looking at now, right? So this this is basically, yeah, what yeah. my thoughts are right now. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm available to talk to you about what you might do uh, and might want to do. Um, so definitely reach out, uh, Mary Bell, and I, I'm happy to talk to you, you know, uh, make my time available to you to, to see okay. if, we, if we dig in maybe, uh, um, I can give you some very, some, some very concrete ways to, to, uh, to move forward. Um, and that applies to, I think, all of y'all. If you have a business that you think this applies to, I think it, all of you take payments of some kind, right? And so that will be uh, Joel at the next event where Joel will talk mostly about okay. how, how the payment systems work. But how this might impact your industry, um, I think one of the fundamental questions we shall be asking ourselves is that law of, 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 of exchange. Right? Do we have? In, are you in an industry where there are intermediaries that are inflationary? Like, take the banking industry. They've gone from uh, less than I think less than ten percent of GDP to over twenty percent of GDP in the last twenty to thirty years. That's an inflationary intermediary that is trying to extract more and more value out of the ecosystem, and that's why decentralized finance has taken off the way that it actually has. So that's kind of a, a that's kind of a predictor, right? If, uh, if your industry has intermediaries that are particularly not liked by the people who are buying and supplying you know, assets and services, um, look at what's happening with Visa and MasterCard. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a warning. Um, the capacity for the community to come together and to construct a digital intermediary that's transparent, where the way it functions is uh, the community votes on it, and that that intermediary is now deflationary. It's, it's designed to take out less of the ecosystem between the buyers and sellers of services and goods. Those will be the ones that grow. This is a huge paradigm shift in terms of the way human beings can self-organize and can assert their values uh, and can build an economy based on those values. So uh, I would say, look at the intermediaries and begin evaluating how effective they are uh, at making the economy within which you operate more efficient because if they're failing, that's an invitation to, to disrupt. Real quick, Alan, so I wanna, oh, okay. Real quick, I wanna let everybody know we're coming to the hour. 
Uh, we want to keep and honor everybody's time, but we will stay on here for longer with questions if you have them. Uh, also, if you do need to leave, pop your question into the chat. I'm going to save the chat at the end so we can make sure we get your questions answered, uh, even if you if you need to go. But we can keep going here for for a little while longer for those who want to stay on. Uh, I'm answer some questions real quick. So books and videos, yes, absolutely. I, I can I, I will happily follow up this uh, this this session with an email with some uh, really good links. Um, little videos that are short <laughs> uh, that are um, uh, and, and some very important documents um, that can help you sort of understand the landscape and and how it's evolving. So I'm happy to, to share those. Um, See. Oh, we have some questions about NFTs. Um, yeah, uh, it, what, um, we have a few minutes. So I actually want to play a game with everyone real quick. Um, if you know, if you have your, your cell phone, uh, pull it out and turn on your camera. And I'm going to introduce you to the metaverse. Now look through your camera at the room around you. And what we're seeing here is a digital overlay of the physical world we're seeing behind the camera, right? And this digital overlay can be many things, can be actually many applications. Um, Pokemon Go was sort of like this. It was a game overlaying the physical world. As we move to, 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 uh, to smart glasses, this, this digital world and this physical world are going to merge. If you want to get a sense of what that would be like, literally just turn on your camera and walk around your house and imagine an application identifying things and automating things, uh, multiple layers of things, AI altering things, uh, even your ears, what you hear being manipulated. This is this inescapable and pervasive merge digital and physical reality that we're all kind of barreling into. And if what we build is going to literally alter the way our brains function as a species. So uh, we'll talk more about the, the, the metaverse um, in, in a future session. Uh, we'll have Dr. Mark come in and, and talk about that. He has a book coming out. Um, but congratulations, you guys all experienced the metaverse today just as on our, our last ending closing minutes. Um, it's actually, you know, th there's mental models we can use to sort of grasp these changes. Uh, and I encourage, um, that's one of the things I'll be doing with you guys is, is handing over these mental models. Now, I'm not a finance person. I am not a cryptographer. And if I can begin to grasp these themes and these ideas, then I believe everyone here can as well. Um, we're combining everything that I don't know about math and everything I don't know about money, okay? And we're trying to make sense of it all. So it is a bit overwhelming, um, but th there are tools like these techniques, like I just showed you guys. You want, you want, you want, you want to preview the metaverse? You can do it right now with, with, your, with your phone. So, um, and with that, Aaron, I guess we're at the top of the hour, so. Does anybody else have any other questions or curiosities, concerns, comments, anything they want to add to tonight? All right, well, just to recap, we're going to be doing these every other week. We potentially will be doing uh, another one uh, at a different time of day. One second, Jer. At a different time of day, potentially we'll have one in the, the late afternoon, one in the mid-morning time. Uh, and then in between those weeks, again, we will have a clubhouse or potentially a LinkedIn group where we get in and for an hour and answer people's questions. So kind of, Alan called it a kind of a fireside chat discussion, meaning after the events, if you had questions and stuff, or even they pop into your mind, we'll be posting when the times or those are. We're gonna work on that over tomorrow, uh, but we should have the answer for that by end of day Monday and we'll announce the entire series and whatnot and when, when you can expect it. Uh, and we'll make sure that we follow up with emails, like I said, answering some questions, giving you guys some resources based on what you asked for, as well as what we covered the, for that webinar. There will be the recording to review as well. Uh, and yeah, I think that's about all the announcements and we'll see what JR has to say. One last question. You, may, you guys may uh, jump into this, but when we get into NFTs and, and it probably correlates to Coinbase and things like this too, are you guys going to discuss or explain um, the tax behind it, right? So I think the thing that scares me the most about jumping into this world is obviously what 
tax incentives may or may not be applied or regulated as of today, comparatively, comparatively to where it's going. So I know if that's going to be a big discussion as well. Yes, I think we should. I think that um, the NFT space is interesting. Um, there's real profound uses for these non-fungible tokens in, uh, in, in, in real business that I think are not being talked about enough. And at the same time, there's a lot of, uh, I call it the, the Star Spangled Banner, kind of rockets red glare, rockets bursting in air. Um, um, a lot of spectacle. Um, so I think when we, I'm actually really excited about the NFT one coming up because I'm looking forward to sort of separating out all of the, the fireworks right, from what matters, the flags, right, um, and, uh, and the real uses uh, where groups of people are coming together and, and can see um, real ways in business to use this stuff as a competitive advantage. Um, to your point, though, we, we, there's actually two interesting side topics that one, one is the taxes that you mentioned, and the other one is when it comes to the digital creative works, it's, it's the, the, the legal landscape around copyrights is also a bit vague. So I say vague, it's Come, there's some complexities to it. So when we get to NFTs, we have a lot of, a lot to talk about. Um, we might find that that topic warrants more than one discussion. To your point, it's it's the NFTs are actually a big a big. Uh, we'll see if we can cover it in one hour. All right. Anybody else have anything else to share? Ask on. If not, I think we'll wrap it up. Alan, awesome job. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to feedback from everybody as well. And yeah, I think it's exciting. Nice Thank work, you Alan. You bet. Thanks, guys. All right, everybody. Thanks, Joel. Have a good night.